everybody! I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. Today's video is actually a little bit special because today's video was actually requested. This is my first requested video and I actually really like the idea of doing requested videos. So if you have a topic that you want me to cover, go ahead and comment down below and let me know and then I'll make a video on it. And then don't forget to subscribe, that way you'll be notified of every time I make a video. So let's get into today's topic, infectious disease. So let's talk about the different types of pathogens. Pathogens are anything that can invade your body and make you sick. So bacteria is a common one we think of. E. coli is just an example of a common bacterial infection, like a UTI. Those are usually caused by E. coli. Viruses, an example of a virus could be herpes. And what's special about viruses? They use the host, so like the human, the host genetics to reproduce. Fungi are molds and yeasts. So a common one of those is uh, Candida albicans. Prions are protein particles. So an example of this is Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. And then parasites include protozoas and helmets. So protozoa, an example of that is like a malaria. And then a helmet example is like worms, like a round worm or something like that. So now that we know the different types of pathogens, let's talk about the infection cycle. Now that we've talked about the different types of pathogens, let's talk about the infection chain. So the first thing is our pathogen, which is the agent, the agent that's causing us to get sick. We need a reservoir. Usually this is us. It's humans, it's people. It can be food or soil, something like that. It needs a portal of exit. So how is it going to leave your body? So some examples, it could leave through the GI, the GU, uh, the respiratory tracts, or blood or body fluids. It needs a mode of transmission. So this is how we're going to spread it to other people. And there's lots of different ways we can spread various things. So direct contact, so that's person to person, sneeze in your hand and then shake somebody's hand, that's direct contact. Indirect contact, so that's object to person, so sneeze in your hand, touch a doorknob, and then somebody else comes along and touches that same doorknob. They got it. The fecal oral route, so that's simply not washing your hands after you go to the bathroom. Droplet is sneezing, coughing, or talking. Airborne is just sneezing or coughing, and then vector-borne is through animals or insects. An example of a vector-borne contagion is like a Lyme disease. So after it's been transmitted, we need a host, which is our portal of entry. Sometimes the portal of entry and the portal of exit can be the same. So maybe it enters through the skin or through blood or body fluids or the GI tract. It could also be the same way it exits, so depending on what it is. And then we need a susceptible host, so somebody who's more likely to um, get this infection. So anybody who's compromised, so compromised defense mechanisms. So this could be because of like immunosuppression, um, it could be because of like medications causing this, or literally anybody with a break in their skin, like a cut or a scrape or a wound, is considered compromised. So now that we know about the chain of infection, let's talk about the stages of infection. Now let's talk about the stages of infection. Our first stage is the incubation stage. What happens during the incubation stage is the pathogen enters the body and then we, the host, start feeling those first, you know, initial signs and symptoms. Moving on to the prodromal stage, so we have our first signs and symptoms, they're probably pretty generalized, but in this stage they go from generalized to more specific. And what's happening in your body during this time is the infection, the pathogen, it's multiplying. Then we get to the third stage, which is the illness stage. So this is when we have specific signs and symptoms to an infection. And this is usually when people start um, seeking medical treatment at this point. Usually in the prodromal stage, we might seek medical treatment or we might try to treat it ourselves at home. It's, oh, it's not too bad, I can handle it. Um, but around the third stage, the illness stage, this is when we're going to doctor. And then finally, the fourth stage is the convalescent stage. So this is when all of our acute signs and symptoms disappear. Now, just because our acute signs and symptoms are disappearing doesn't mean that we're all better, we're cured, it's fine, right? We still could have that infection, but 
those signs and symptoms are starting to go away, and that's a good sign. And one thing I really wanted to point out in this is you can be contagious in the incubation stage. So in the incubation stage, before you even have any signs and symptoms, before you even know that you're sick, you could still be contagious and you could still be spreading it to other people. That is why we do standard precautions in nursing, right? Every patient you interact with, washing your hands, scrub in, scrub out, every single time, right? So I really encourage everybody to wash their hands with soap and water. If soap and water isn't available to you, use a hand sanitizer. But always washing your hands, doing good hand hygiene all the time. Not just when you're sick, but literally every day of your life, you should be washing your hands. Now let's talk about who's at risk. So who's at risk? The immunocompromised. So this could be somebody um, on chemotherapy, somebody recovering from an illness or a surgery, the elderly, and babies. People with low oxygen saturation in their body or people with poor decreased circulation, those who have acute or chronic diseases going on, and then the very old and the very young. Now I wanna talk specifically about the very old, the elderly population, because when we hear about people getting sick, a lot of times we hear about it affecting the elderly the most, and I'm gonna talk about why. So what's going on with the elderly normal, with the normal aging process that makes them more susceptible to infection? Well, a lot of things. So the first is they have decreased inflammatory and immune responses. There's a loss of subcutaneous tissue and their skin is thinner, so those defense mechanisms are kind of impaired. There's a decrease in vascularity, so we talked about that over here, the decrease in circulation. They have slower wound healing, kind of as a result of all these things. Um, they have a decreased cough and gag reflex. So I'm not saying the elderly people can't cough or gag, they can, uh, but maybe not as like strong as they could when they were younger, so it's harder for them to get that stuff out. And then they have other illnesses going on, comorbidities. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have a comorbidity, so something else going on, some other sort of chronic disease. And some really important things I wanted to point out is in the elderly, we may not identify the infection until it's much more advanced. So they might have been infected for quite some time, but we didn't notice it because of these natural things that's going on with them. And then some signs and symptoms that are a little bit special to the elderly. You know, they might have the same stuff we have, fatigue, shortness of breath, a high fever, definitely. But they might not. They might not have any of those symptoms, and their only symptoms could be Agitation, confusion, and incontinence. So if you're taking care of an elderly person and they start acting agitated, confused, or incontinent, and they otherwise didn't do that before and they were otherwise healthy, that could be a red flag for you. You might be thinking infection at this point. If we suspect an infection on our patient, we're gonna take a few different labs. So we're gonna take a CBC and what we're gonna be looking at is their white blood cell count. If it's elevated, that kind of indicates that there's something going on there, maybe an infection. Their ESR rate will be elevated. What this tells us is there's some sort of active inflammation or infection in the body. And then finally, if we can, we're gonna take a culture. So a culture from fluids, a culture from a wound, from blood, wherever we can take a culture from, we're gonna take a culture, and that's gonna help us identify the specific type of pathogen that's infecting our patient. Our treatment is gonna be pathogen dependent. So if it's our E. coli, if it's a worm, if it's yeast, whatever it is, a virus, it's all gonna be treated differently. So our number one key here is prevention. So preventing the pathogen from entering the body of a susceptible host in the first place. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna educate our patients on how to prevent from getting sick in the first place. So our patient education for prevention of infection include, number one, of course, washing our hands. We're gonna wash our hands multiple times a day, every day, before we eat, after we use the restroom, after we touch surfaces that we're not sure if they're clean, if they look visibly soiled, right? So washing your hands or sanitizing your hands, doing proper hand hygiene all the time, every day. Standard precautions. Oral hygiene, that's not one we talk about a ton, but it's actually really important. So brushing your teeth several times a day, maybe in the morning and at night, because what happens is if you don't brush your teeth and the food's just stuck in there, that's a breeding ground for bacteria. 
and then every time you eat something, the bacteria grows and it showers it down your throat and then it can spread throughout your body. So it's very important to brush your teeth. Making sure they're up to date on their vaccinations, their immunizations. Encouraging them to drink fluid, drink lots of water. It's gonna help flush out the body. And then of course, covering our mouth when coughing and sneezing. So our vampire cough into our, into our wrists, right? We're not <coughs> and then touching stuff. Right, you wouldn't do that, that's rude and it's gross. So encouraging them to cough into their elbow and not their hands. So this was my video on the infectious disease process. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Please, 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 if you take anything away from this video, it's wash your hands on a regular basis, all the time, not only when you're sick. And thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.